It must be remembered that when communities create their own money, it is suitable only for small towns or groups of closely located villages or small communities, the members of which have agreed to use it within their own geographical area only. It does not work in distant places where the money is not recognized. Once employment and production are boosted, entrepreneurs from within the community can then find traders from outside and local script can be phased out. But for internal economic exchange, smaller groups may continue to use this local script if they want to. In fact, Guernsey Island and the Austrian village were so successful that outside banks plotted to take them over. In the case of the Austrian town, the Austrian National Bank put a stop to it because it feared that successful local currencies would threaten its central control over the country's finances. In 2008, 46 of USA's 50 states were hit. But there was one state that had no problems whatsoever. This was the publicly owned Bank of North Dakota. It was set up in 1919 for the exclusive purpose of serving the people of North Dakota. It offers services only to any resident or company of the state, including students needing loans, small farmers and small businesses. It believes that by helping customers in their economic activity, it strengthens the community and thereby the state economy. To others, the idea seemed old-fashioned and quaint, and no one paid attention to them until the crash. The following year, only four of the 50 states of America escaped financial ruin. North Dakota was one of them. In fact, the Bank of North Dakota boasted the largest surplus ever in its 90-year history. It was the only state that added jobs instead of axing them and searched out new ways to spend its surplus. Some other states are now trying to follow its example. What was the secret of its success? No secret. Their approach was to seek mutual benefit for both customer and bank, not undue profit for the bank alone. It does not lend to outsiders nor invests in outside enterprises. Its profits and investments are rolled back into North Dakota. If the customer cannot gain, neither can the bank. It also serves as a mini central bank for the state to take care of essential cross-border transactions. Alternative currencies have made a comeback all over the world. But they are seldom discussed in the media. And they are never discussed by the mainstream media, which are owned or controlled by the major corporations that include the big banks that don't want alternative currencies and systems to succeed. Alternative currencies or systems come under many different names. In the US, there are time dollars, in which labor by the hour is exchanged for goods. In some English-speaking countries, there is LETS, which stands for Local Exchange Trading System. They all essentially serve the same purpose. Ever since national currencies of the many different European countries were replaced by the euro, the use of alternative currencies has actually grown. The reason was to maintain the strength of local communities versus the euro, representing a few dozen countries. They do not seek to replace the euro, merely protect their own local interests. In fact, they serve as a complementary system that helps small economies remain self-reliant while working successfully with big ones. Most people think of barter being outdated, impractical and no longer in use. They would be surprised to know that today's modern barter systems are far more sophisticated than other financial systems, are more economical and fair, and overcome problems during financial crisis. 
especially when countries are hard up for foreign exchange. In fact, for global trade, modern barter is a more efficient and far more just system. It opens up new markets and widens existing ones, locally and nationally, for small and medium businesses and creates huge opportunities in global trade without requiring huge investment. How do barter exchanges work? Governments do sometimes engage in barter, usually in an emergency only. The barter exchange is a commercial organization born out of necessity, created for small and medium businesses that were often short on cash and unable to compete with the big guns. Medium businesses no longer have to run around for themselves, hunting for buyers or sellers. Interested parties and sellers first become members of the exchange. Thanks to the internet and special software programs created for barter, it deals with the most complex of deals involving many parties and a vast array of goods spread around the world. It also maintains records, carries out all necessary procedures and paperwork. Members receive monthly statements, constantly updated information and advice on items for sale or purchase. They are not obligated to buy from or sell to anyone in particular. Goods are valued by an internal measure known as barter dollars or trade dollars, not any national currency. These are not convertible to legal tender. The difference between barter money and bank money is that it is not a fiction invented out of thin air. It represents real goods only. It is merely a way to calculate the worth of goods. Best of all, there is no interest charge whatsoever as banks do. The barter exchange charges only a one-time commission of between 8 and 15% for services actually rendered. Why then should people pay crippling interest for bank loans when they don't provide any real or complete service? Big banks tend to ignore small businessmen who have nowhere else to turn to. This gap has been filled by barter exchanges. Big businesses are not eligible to join. Necessity has always been the mother of invention. The first modern day barter exchange system was created out of necessity in Switzerland in 1934 following a stock market crash and currency shortage. It is known as the Weir Bank and continues to function to this day. Only small and medium companies are allowed to be members. Big and medium banks cater only to those who have money and exclude the majority. The Weir Bank takes care of the majority, the small and medium businesses and entrepreneurs. Barter exchanges today are a $12 billion industry and growing. They involve 100 countries and some 600,000 small and medium companies. 350,000 of these are in USA alone, which many thought wouldn't care for anything but dollars. But there are about 400 commercial barter exchanges around the world today, serving hundreds of thousands of businesses. Even the World Trade Organization and the Economist of London say that barter accounts for half a trillion dollars worth of business between countries every year. But you do not hear of it. Over a couple of decades ago, the Internal Reciprocal Trade Association, or IRTA, was created when various trade exchanges wanted to get to know one another and work together. In 1996, IRTA created its own universal currency to further smooth barter operations. It makes trade direct, faster and more economical through its universal currency clearinghouse. It enables barter exchanges between trading countries by using their universal currency. Is there a barter exchange or IRTA branch in your country? You should find out.
In many small towns and big cities, small barter exchanges have been set up to facilitate local transactions. Offerings are posted at community centers or post offices or other places where people gather or on the internet. In this, not only can goods be exchanged, but also services or goods exchanged for services and vice versa. For example, a carpenter could exchange his services for bulk groceries and other household goods from a store owner. A New York lawyer has actually prepared wills and other documentation in exchange for getting his floors polished and house painted by service providers. A dentist has provided his services in exchange for a bicycle, a watch, a painting and even a pet pup. Such arrangements can be one-off when one is strapped for cash or ongoing. The possibilities are endless and always exist. Just as the conventional money and banking system does not serve all economic purposes at all times for most people, neither does barter, although it is much more economical and flexible. For example, sometimes a service or an article up for offer has no takers at a given point of time. But then, in the current banking system, loans are not readily available to most people either. It's not that we have to choose between modern barter or the banking system. The best of both systems could combine or coexist after removing unfair banking practices. That would mean eliminating interest altogether and charging one-time standardized fees for services actually provided. If the current banking system does not take these steps, sooner or later, the barter exchange system themselves will be pressed to take up more and more functions of banks and render them redundant. That will be bad for self-serving big banks, but it would be good for the world. Women who are always the worst hit in all social and economic crises have the most to gain by taking up this cause.